So I didn't show you this picture when I was talking about the cardiac conduction pathway, um, but it kind of shows the different steps, uh, much like the animation in the EKG game I was just showing you. Um, but part of the reason I'm not showing it, I didn't show it to you, is because it's sort of repeated a little bit later on after talking about the um, EKG. Here's sort of the same picture, but it has added to it uh, what's going on in the EKG. So uh, here's the SA node, and it's colored yellow, representing that it's fired off, and the arrows showing that stuff spreading from that through the atria, including to the AV node, and that's the P wave. Hey. Excuse me. Um, and after that happens, then the atrial walls will depolarize and contract. So the way they've drawn this, the atrial walls are a little bit uh, depressed in on either side compared to the first picture, showing that they're contracting. And then uh, in the EKG, there's nothing going on during this time. Uh, it's in this flat line area here because we're not seeing any change in electrical activity. Uh, <clears throat> even though the atria are still depolarized, the trace has gone back down to zero because there's no change in electrical activity. And it stays that way until um, the signal ends up traveling down the uh, bundle branches, et cetera, et cetera, and getting to the ventricular walls, and that's when we have the QRS complex which causes contraction of the ventricular walls, which we see here. These two pictures are really, I think, the same thing. I think they meant to do something different here, but it looks like it's the exact same picture. But this would be, with the T wave, um, they should have all of the purple removed, and it's back to uh, its depolarized, I mean, repolarized state there. Um, And then after the T wave, it's back to the flat line because there's nothing going on. And at this point, there's nothing going on because uh, the heartbeat's complete. Um, so that just sort of shows you uh, the players there. Um, here we have the EKG, and it's lined up with um, these lines here defining the different parts of what we call the cardiac cycle, or one heartbeat. Um, as far as the way that the pictures are in the book, I'm actually jumping ahead one picture, but it'll be obvious why in a second. Um, <clears throat> there are two words I want to introduce to you here. They are diastole and systole. Diastole just means relaxation, as far as muscles <coughs> are concerned. And systole means contraction. So when we're describing what's happening in the heartbeat, we use these two terms describing what the two different chambers are doing. Uh, now, the right and the left sides are doing the exact same thing at the same time. So when we say atrial systole, what we are saying is both the right and the left atria are contracting. They work independently, but they're electrically coupled together, so they do the same thing at the same time. Um, and that's... We see that bar lining up the EKG trace from the P wave to the QRS complex. It represents about 100 milliseconds worth of time, and the time will be depicted in the next picture. Um, <clears throat> while the atrial systole uh, period is going on, the ventricular uh, diastole is still going on from the previous heartbeat. So the ventricles are relaxed when the atria contract. And then right here in the middle of the QRS complex, everything switches over. The atria have relaxed and repolarized, and the ventricles start to depolarize and contract. And we go into ventricular systole, which is much longer than atrial systole. I skipped over in the book where it's talking about cardiac uh, um, atrial potentials. They're a little bit different from the atrial potentials you studied before um, because they last for longer. Um, the pictures in the book are showing you ash potentials of ventricular cells, which last about 250 to 300 milliseconds long. Um, they don't show you atrial uh, cell um, ash potentials, but those last about 100 milliseconds long. 
and they last for a long time instead of the couple or a few milliseconds of action potentials that we usually think about because uh, after they hit their peak, they stay depolarized for however long, depending on the type of cell, because of calcium entering into the cell. It keeps them depolarized, and the calcium helps to sustain contraction. Um, so, so contraction sustained for almost 300 milliseconds during ventricular systole, and the ventricles then go into diastole. They then um, relax and repolarize, which is what we see at the T wave. Okay. Um, now, the gray bar at the bottom is labeled one cardiac cycle. That's one heartbeat. Starts at the P wave, goes all the way through until just before the next P wave starts up. Um, and we see then atrial systole is the first 100 milliseconds or so. Ventricular systole is the next almost 300 milliseconds. And then uh, after the ventricles have contracted, they go and die into diastole. And the atria are still in diastole because they finished contracting a while ago. Really the second half of the heartbeat is just relaxation all around. Everything's relaxed. Now, this picture is really just uh, taking apart this other picture, which in the book is a little bit before, but I want to start here to the, describe systole and diastole. But what we were just looking at, those two lines are basically the inner and outer circles of this uh, circle here. And this is showing you how atrial, I mean, sorry, this is showing you how um, the cardiac cycle progresses through one heartbeat. We have the EKG highlighted here with the P wave, QRS complex, T wave, showing you when those, those events are occurring. And the time is represented pretty much to scale here. Um, we start at this point here. For some weird reason in the book, they put the start there, but it really should be there. We start when atrial systole begins. Atrial systole is going to cause the atria to contract and push blood down into the ventricles. Um, it's a fairly minor contraction, and it only moves a little bit of blood because most of the blood's already moved in, which we'll see a little later on. After about 100 milliseconds, that's over, and the uh, ventricular systole starts. And ventricular systole lasts a lot longer. Um, it's like 270 milliseconds, I think, to be exact, but it's, you know, between 250 and 300 milliseconds. Um, and the ventricles will contract and push the blood out into the arteries, either the pulmonary trunk of the pulmonary artery or the aorta. Um, and then after that, the heart relaxes. Now, if you look at how long the heart overall is relaxed, so the end of ventricular systole to the beginning of atrial systole, for the second half of the whole thing. That's a pretty large section of the whole thing. And if we just think about uh, ventricular diastole, that's a pretty, you know, almost two-thirds of what we have here. Atrial systole is actually about um, eight-tenths of what we have here, atrial diastole. So the heart is actually relaxed more than it's contracting during one heartbeat. It spends a little bit more time relaxed, just contracts in those two different times. Now, we can actually separate this up into, instead of just atrial systole, ventricular systole, and everything in diastole, um, we can separate it into five different events, uh, which is why there's five different pictures here. Um, atrial systole is the first event. Okay, that's all that happens. The atria contract, no big deal. Um, but then atrial, I mean, ventricular systole has two events going on, and then ventricular diastole has two events going on. Um, <clears throat> the way that they have to draw this, it looks like these are five equally separated out little set of events, but that's not actually true. Um, the first few um, milliseconds of, eight of ventricular systole, so probably as far as the circle is concerned, only about that much of the time, this is what's happening in the heart. It's called iso isovolumetric contraction. 
Now, the book gives you isovolumic or isovolumetric, two variations on the same thing. They both mean volume doesn't change. Iso as a prefix means the same. And then volumic or volumetric are both referring to the volume. Uh, calling it volumetric means measuring the volume. But uh, I usually use isovolumetric in that term there. Um, what that means is all of the valves are closed. The AV valves have closed at the end of atrial systole, and the semilunar valves have not yet opened. So for a few milliseconds, everything's closed, just like all of the doors in this room are closed. Okay? Nobody's getting in, nobody's getting out. Okay? I haven't locked the doors, obviously, but you get the idea. Okay. Um, the blood is not changing volume, because all the blood that can get into the ventricles for a heartbeat has gotten in there, nothing started leaving yet. Okay. But contraction has started. So the walls of the uh, ventricle are starting to contract, and that's going to build up pressure to help push the blood out. But it takes a little bit of time for the pressure to build up. Okay. So we have that isovolumetric contraction. And as soon as the pressure gets high enough, the semilunar valves will open and blood will be ejected into the arteries, and we call that ventricular ejection. Uh, on the right side, it's ejecting the blood into the pulmonary trunk. On the left side, it's ejecting it into the aorta. Okay. They're both doing the same thing at the same time. Then when we move into ventricular diastole, um, we have, again, two different events there. And also, again, they're not actually equally uh, equal time periods within there, we begin in the first few milliseconds with what's called isovolumetric relaxation. Same thing as isovolumetric contraction, except the muscles relax instead of contracting. In both situations, all the valves are closed and no blood's getting in and no blood's getting out. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, we filled the ventricles as much as we could and we're building up pressure before we eject the blood. After all the blood's been ejected, the semilunar valves will close so blood can't get back into the ventricles, and the AV valves have not yet opened to let new blood in. So everything is closed, but now the heart muscle is relaxing, and the pressure in the ventricles is dropping rapidly. Once that pressure is dropped, um, the AV valves will open again, and the majority of ventricular diastole is what we call ventricular filling. Okay. This is passive. The blood just moves from the right atrium to the right ventricle or the left atrium to the left ventricle. There's nothing pushing it outside of the inherent pressure in the whole system. It's not until we get to atrial systole in the next heartbeat that we actively push any of the blood in. But really about 70% of the blood that moves from the atrium to the ventricles does it during this passive filling phase here. Only about 30% needs to be pushed at the very end to get it up. Um, so that, those are the events in one heartbeat, five different events. Atrial systole is about 100 milliseconds long. Um, isovolumetric contraction of the ventricles, which is only a few milliseconds long as pressure builds up in the ventricles. And once the semilunar valves open, we go into ventricular ejection, which is the rest of ventricular system. So 250 some odd seconds, uh, milliseconds long. Mm -hmm. And then after that happens, we go into isovolumetric relaxation, again, only for a few milliseconds, where all the valves are closed, again, and pressure drops in the ventricles. And then once pressure is low enough, the AV valves will open and blood will move, <coughs> fill the ventricles during the ventricular filling. Okay. Um, so that's one way of kind of breaking up what's going on here. Another way to look at what's happening here is to concentrate on the pressures that are taking place. And so this picture here is looking at those pressures. Now, <coughs> Any book that has a drawing like this is going to have some problems with it. Um, the artist who made this, graphic artist who made this, is not a physiologist and was not trying to be terribly <coughs> exact with the, the lines. So there are a few little quirks in the lines. 
Um, and it's just because of how it's drawn. And every textbook I've ever used has the exact same problems. Um, so I'll say that there's a few things that are a little different here, and I'll point them out as we get to it. But we're looking at three different pressures. The red line is the pressure that we measure in the aorta. The yellow line is the pressure that we measure in the left atrium. And the green line is the pressure that we measure in the left ventricle. Now I'm very specific here talking about structures on the left side of the heart. Okay. These pressures are for the left side. The right side pressures are very different. Um, the left side is pumping oxygenated blood out to the body. It needs a lot of pressure to push blood all the way throughout the body. The right side is pushing, pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs. It needs a lot less pressure to do that. So. Uh, the same concepts apply to the right side, but the exact numbers are going to be different because uh, the left side of the heart just pumps more strongly. There's more muscle tissue in the left ventricle wall than in the right ventricle wall. But the same ideas uh, apply. Now, um, <clears throat> overall, what really drives anything here is that fluids of any sort, and I use the word fluid because that applies to liquids like blood, or air, like we'll study in the respiratory system, concepts the same. Fluids will always move from high pressure to low pressure. Doesn't matter if it's a very minor pressure difference or if it's a huge pressure difference. So it will always move from high to low pressure. So at the beginning here, the yellow line is slightly above the green line because the pressure in the atria is slightly higher than the pressure in the ventricle. And that little bit of difference there is enough to move blood from the atria to the ventricles. It's the only way that the blood can move. The blood can't move from the ventricles to the atria, partly because the pressure's off, and partly because the valves won't allow that to happen. The valves only allow blood to move in one direction. Now we have a third player on the picture here, which is the aorta. But blood's not going to move from the atrium into the aorta directly because they're not connected. Okay. Also, the pressure's backwards for that. Now, you could say that blood goes from the aorta into the, um, the atrium, but the connections are really quite convoluted because the aorta goes out to the body, back to the right side of the heart, and right side pumps it to the lungs, and then from the lungs it goes into the left um, atrium. So, Overall, from the red line to the yellow line, yes, blood moves from the aorta to the um, atrium, but it has a very uh, complicated path to get there. But the pressure in the aorta is going to push the blood through most of that pathway. Anyways. But we really only care about what's happening in the heart. And connection-wise, the uh, blood can only go from the atrium into the ventricle. And there's a little bit of a difference in pressure, so that's going to drive that movement a little bit. When we see the line start to go up, meaning that the pressure in the atria is increasing, that's because we're, we've just started atrial system. Okay. The atria are contracting, and therefore the pressure in the atria is going to go up. As that pressure goes up and it pushes blood down into the ventricles, ventricle, the ventricular pressure is going to go up also. But the green line stays below the yellow line because the pressure is just a little bit higher in the uh, atrium than the ventricle. When we see them cross over and they finally completely cross over right here, that's when their pressures are equal. Okay. When the pressure is equalized between the two and then the ventricular pressure is going to start to go up, that's going to push back against the AV valve, which on the left side is the, vi the mitral valve, cause the mitral valve to close because the ventricular pressure is going to push back against the valve and close the leaflets of it. So with the AV valve closed, no new blood can get in. And the aortic valve is going to be closed also because it's closed, left over from the last heartbeat. And so pressure in the ventricle goes up very quickly because at this point, when the valve closed, we also switch from atrial systole to ventricular systole. So with ventricular systole, contraction causes pressure to rise rapidly. Okay. Blood can't go anywhere, so it's just squeezing in on the ventricle and increasing the pressure. Once the pressure matches aortic pressure, 
it's going to push open the aortic valve, or the semilunar valve on the left side, and eject blood out. So the time point from right here to right there is very small, okay? time span, it's a few milliseconds. That's the isovolumetric contraction thing. This is when um, ventricular ejection starts, and we eject blood into the aorta. Now here's one of the places where the, the drawing is a little imprecise. The green line should be above the red line the whole time, okay? And not cross over till we get here. Just the artist, uh, the um, curve didn't quite match the, the red curve and the green curve didn't quite match. Every book I've ever worked with, they always have this kind of problem in it. And it's really just a matter of graphic design. The program that graphic designer uses to make the curves is not a mathematical uh, curve, it's a drawing curve. So they can't get the shape of the curve exactly perfect. And always do, does that. But the green line really should stay above the red line all the way through, and it crosses over here. And when it crosses over, that means that the pressure between the ventricle and the aorta is going to be equal, and the um, semilunar valve is going to close. The aortic valve is going to close because the pressure in the aorta is going to now push back against that valve and close it up. <clears throat> With the semilunar valve now closed and the AV valve still closed from before, the um, we enter into ventricular uh, diastole and pressure drops very rapidly. Again, it's only a few milliseconds long but it falls off very quickly until the ventricular pressure now gets below atrial pressure again and the AV valve opens, the, the mitral valve opens. This is where we enter into ventricular filling and the atrial pressure is a little bit higher than the ventricular pressure all along and that's enough to move the blood in. Um, it's happening passively until we start uh, atrial systole of the next heartbeat here. Now, I said that the graphic designer got these uh, curves off a little bit. Notice that the distance between the yellow and green lines at the beginning and at the end are not precisely the same, and that's, again, the graphic design issue. Um, <clears throat> just that it's not drawn mathematically, but just graphically. And it didn't match the, the curves perfectly. But um, <clears throat> that just shows you the differences in pressure when one line is higher than the other, the blood's going to move from that location, from one location to the next. And the movement's always got to be based on the anatomy, so blood will move from the uh, atrium into the ventricle when pressure allows for it. When the pressure's changed, the valve will close between them and there won't be any movement. Um, and then blood will be ejected from the ventricle into the aorta, and then we go back down to filling at the end. Okay. Um, I didn't talk about pressure at the beginning, other than to say pressure causes movement. But we measure pressure in millimeters of mercury. Um, so when you hear about blood pressure, 80 over 120 or something like that, that's 80 millimeters of mercury over 120 millimeters of mercury. And it's referring to the lowest aortic pressure versus the highest aortic pressure. Okay. So when we say uh, 80 over 120, we're really talking about this span here. That's the pressure in the atrial system, not atrial system, and, uh, arterial system after uh, the heart's pumping blood in there. The lower number, the 80, is called diastolic pressure. And okay? that's the pressure in the aorta um, when the ventricles in diastole. And then the 120 is referred to systolic pressure, which is the peak of pressure during ventricular systole. Right. Um, so those two numbers just represent the variation between those two uh, extremes. Uh, at any given time, it could be anywhere in between those, but that's the range, 120 over 80. Wait, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, down at the bottom, uh, it has heart sounds. I don't 
personally think heart sounds are that amazing of a thing to talk about, um, but the book does spend a little bit of time on it. Um, a heart sound is just when you hear blood moving through the stethoscope. And heart's going to move primarily when the valves close. Okay? So when the AV valves close, and by this we mean both AV valves close, um, you hear the first heart sound. And then when the semilunar valves close, you hear the second heart sound. Okay? Um, any other heart sounds you hear, they've drawn in a third one there, uh, in some sources we'll put a fourth one in. Um, those are usually uh, very minor heart sounds and hard to hear um, unless you're very practiced at it. Um, so really the main heart sounds, which are named love dub there, uh, we usually think of the heart going love dub, love dub, is because one valve closes and then the next valve closes. And at times with the end of atrial um, systole and the end of ventricular systole. That's when those two are. Um, and then from dub in one heartbeat to love in the next heartbeat, there will be a pretty long gap just because uh, that's uh, <clears throat> the entire span of ventricular diastole between the two. Um, <clears throat> so those are heart sounds. Uh, you can listen to those. The book actually has a picture showing uh, places where you can listen to specific heart sounds. Um, if you're really interested. Uh, depending on where you put the Seth scope, you can hear the four different valves um, best. Okay. So if you ever had anybody listening to your heart, they're moving the stethoscope around to these locations to hear specific uh, valve sounds. But uh, <clears throat> so that's the mention of the um, sounds. Okay. Um, what did I put here? Oh, I have to close that out. Um, <clears throat> now, something that the book doesn't show, it does talk about it, but there's not a picture to go with it. Um, and it's actually kind of hard to really depict, um, is talking about the volume of blood. Um, so what's happening here is blood is filling the ventricles. And at the end of atrial systole, the ventricle is going to be completely filled. Okay. Um, or filled as much as it's going to be, depending on conditions. And then uh, after the isovolumetric contraction, we have ejection where the blood that's gotten into the ventricle is going to be ejected out. Um, we use a couple of different terms to describe these volumes, and they have fairly uh, specific and normal um, values. Um, so the first one is end diastolic volume or EDV, which means uh, the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of ventricular diastole, okay. which could just as easily be uh, referring to the end of atrial systole, but we're talking about the ventricles here. Um, and then the other thing is end systolic volume, which is ESV. Um, and this is the volume of blood in the ventricles, ventricle at the end of ventricular systole. Okay. So here you can see why it's important that we just refer to ventricular diastole and ventricular systole. Um, when the ventricles are at the end of diastole, the atria are at the end of systole. Okay. So we've pumped all of the blood we can into the ventricles. and that So end diastolic volume is sort of the maximal volume in the ventricles. And then after ventricular systole, after the ventricles have uh, completely ejected, or sorry, 
have finished contracting and injected all the blood they can. That's end systolic volume. Um, generally, whoops, um, a normal value for EDV would be uh, 130 milliliters of blood. Okay. These are just average numbers here. Uh, they vary from person to person. ESV would be 50 milliliters of blood. Okay. Now, ESV is not going to be zero. You don't eject all of the blood in your ventricles with each heartbeat. Um, <clears throat> to be able to do that, you'd have to completely evacuate the, the ventricle, which would mean it'd be empty. And by empty, we mean a vacuum. There would be nothing in there, and that wouldn't be possible. So there has to be something left over. The difference between these two is called stroke volume. abbreviated SV. Which means EDV minus ESV equals SV. Um, or uh, the reason it's called stroke volume is it's the volume of blood that's ejected in one stroke of the heart. And stroke here is used in the term uh, referring to a pump. Okay? When a pump is uh, working, each cycle of the pump is called a stroke. Okay? Um, or another way of thinking about it is a motor. Um, <clears throat> in your car, when you drive, each revolution of the motor, if you have a tachometer in your car, the RPMs of your uh, motor, that's how many revolutions per minute. Each time the motor turns over once, a piston goes through a movement in a cylinder. That's a stroke. Okay? So stroke volume for the heart is how much, ejection, how much blood is ejected in one heartbeat. Another way to think about this, which I don't think the book actually addresses, or if it does, it just says it in one sentence, is what's called ejection fraction. Um, and this is just a different way of considering what stroke volume is. Ejection fraction is stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. Okay. Just a ratio. <clears throat> so let's think about these values in terms of the numbers I've given you. Okay. What would the stroke volume be if EDV is 130 and ESV is 50? It'd be 80, right. Okay. So uh, if it were 130 minus 50, whoop, 50, that would be equal 80 milliliters. Okay. Um, what would the ejection fraction be in that case? Yeah, it'd be 80 over 130. And we express ejection fractions as a percentage, so we'd have to do the math there. And I'm not going to try to do it in my head. I just pull up. which would equal, in this case, about 61%. Right? Ejection fraction should be somewhere in the 60 to 65% rate um, for normal uh, ejection fractions. Um, <clears throat> the ejection fraction is actually a nice uh, statistic to work with because it's a what we could call a standardized uh, value. Uh, two different people might have different stroke volumes, um, but stroke volume by itself doesn't tell us a whole lot because it depends on the size of the heart and what the end diastolic and systolic volumes are. On. But the ejection fraction tells us what that person's stroke volume is in relation to that person's particular heart values. We can compare two different people's ejection fractions very easily and say 
something about how their two hearts are working. Ejection fraction is a very useful statistic in uh, looking at um, heart disease. Congestive heart failure, which is what um, uh, case three for next week is about, um, is diagnosed based on ejection fraction. Um, if ejection fraction is 35 or below, that's congestive heart failure. I think it's 35. Um, congestive heart failure means that the cardiovascular system is congested. The heart's not moving as well, <coughs> blood around as well. And if it's ejecting a third of the volume of blood instead of two thirds of the volume of blood, then obviously there's not as much blood moving around the system. And that's the whole point behind the congestion. Um, so you'll often see ejection fraction in clinical situations more than the uh, straight up stroke volume or any of these other things because this is a statistic that's easily com comparable from one patient to another. So you can have two pe people, one person with a stroke volume of 80 and one person with a stroke volume of 70 perhaps, and it doesn't mean anything because there are a lot of other variables for each particular person. But if the person with stroke volume at 80 has um, a end diastolic volume of 160, I'm making up numbers here, I've not done the math, and the person with 70 has an end diastolic volume of 125, then their ejection fractions are going to be very different. I haven't done the math, but 180 over 160 is probably somewhere in the, well, that's 50%. And that did not get that's 50%, but one, a 70 over 125 is probably about 65%. So those ejection fractions are very different. Okay. Higher stroke volume, lower ejection fraction because it depends on what the end diastolic volume was. Lower stroke volume, higher ejection fraction again because it depends on what the end diastolic volume is. So ejection fraction is a very handy ratio to just get a quick picture of how well the heart's doing its job of ejecting blood during ventricular system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that kind of gets through the uh, cardiac cycle stuff. Um, actually, I guess the cardiac physiology is where they talk about, uh, nope, it isn't. I thought this is where they talk about, well, they kind of do. Um, <clears throat> and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, they talk about stroke volume here, um, but when we think about cardiac physiology, how the heart, cardiovascular system and the heart works primarily, uh, we think about it in terms of what's called cardiac output. Now, cardiac output is a combination of stroke volume and heart rate, mathematically defined. Um, CO is a value that's however many beats per minute times however many milliliters per heartbeat. Okay? And that'll give you, at the end, a value of how much blood the heart is pumping per minute. Um, resting cardiac output for most people is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of five liters. Um, and they present the numbers there and kind of cover it all. But that's basically it. Now, um, here, it's just a mathematical uh, uh, definition of, of cardiac output. But really, cardiac output is how efficient the blood, I mean, how efficient the heart is at moving the blood through the system. At rest, we really only need to move about five liters of blood per minute. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty close to our entire blood volume. Uh, it varies from person to person exactly how much blood somebody has, but five liters is about average. Um, there's not some cosmic significance to that, it just happens to be that over the minute, of the course of a minute, uh, we'll tend to pump about our entire blood volume through our blood, uh, our system. Um, <clears throat> when we need more cardiac output, when we need our heart to work harder, we can adjust those things. We can increase heart rate or we can increase stroke volume. And that'll uh, bring cardiac output up. Um, everybody has a maximal cardiac output value. Um, and that's as much work as your heart can do. Uh, it depends on those two feet, those two values. 
Um, with age, heart rate, rate decreases. Um, the rule of thumb for maximal heart rate for somebody is um, your age, nope, said that wrong, 220 beats per minute minus your age. Right? Uh, so uh, somebody who's zero years old, their maximal heart rate should be at 220 beats per minute. Somebody who's 20 years old, their maximal heart rate should be 200 beats per minute. Somebody who's 40, it should be 180. Somebody who's 60, it should be 160, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's just a rule of thumb. It's a pretty good estimate of what it should be, uh, but that doesn't mean at your next birthday your heart rate's going to go down by one beat. Okay, that's just a rule of thumb. Um, and it has to do with the fact with increasing age, cardiac muscle can't work quite as efficient. Um, we mostly control heart rate through the autonomic system. Okay? Uh, the resting cardiac output largely is based on the parasympathetic control of our heart rate. Okay? If we remove parasympathetic control, our cardiac output's going to go up just because uh, we're always slowing our heart rate down. SA node normally fires about 100 beats per minute, but it rests at 70 some odd beats per minute. So if the parasympathetic system stops slowing down the heart rate, then your cardiac output's going to go up immediately because of that. Okay. Um, and then the sympathetic side can get things to go beyond that. So if you need your heart rate to go above 100 beats per minute, sympathetic system will take it up there. When you're exercising, you're probably not pushing for maximal heart rate the whole time. You might want to keep it in the you know, low hundreds, 120 or something like that. Uh, for just you know getting on the treadmill or whatever you might do for exercise, but that's going to keep your uh, <clears throat> cardiac output up, which is going to get blood around your body faster and get oxygen and nutrients to the muscles that are doing that work. Right. You can also adjust heart rate by uh, working on stroke volume. Um, I'm sorry. You can also adjust cardiac output by working on stroke volume. I said that backwards. Um, Oh, before I get into the stroke volume thing, since it's in the book here, let me go through it. Uh, this is just depicting the nervous system control of the heart. Um, this is not entirely anatomically correct. Um, <clears throat> from the medulla, there's a region called, oh, it's not on the screen here, um, called the cardiac or cardiovascular center. Um, it has some outputs that will decrease cardiac output and some that will increase cardiac output. The ones that decrease cardiac output we refer to as cardio inhibitory centers, and they work primarily through the parasympathetic system. Okay. And so here's the first non anatomically correct point of this they have a dot in the medulla representing a neuron, and they show that neuron coming out of the medulla and synapsing here. Okay. That's actually happening completely, completely within the brainstem. From the brainstem, another neuron comes out, and its axon is in the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve has branches that end right next to the heart, um, where they synapse on the terminal ganglion of the heart. And they influence the SA node and the AV node, which is what those two endings there are suggesting, to help bring heart rate down. The other thing here uh, coming out of the medulla represents the other side of the cardiovascular system, which is referred to as cardioacceleratory areas, okay. inhibitory or an acceleratory. Um, those are really the um, sympathetic inputs. Now, this is very anatomically incorrect. This neuron in the medulla would go down to the thoracic spinal cord, um, synapse there, and then a fiber would come out of the thoracic spinal cord um, whoops, and synapse in the uh, chain ganglia. And then the chain ganglion fibers are the ones that are coming out here that are labeled sympathetic cardiac nerves. Um, they go to the SA node or the AV node and some of them also go to the ventricular wall. Okay. Now, all of the parasympathetic inputs, which are to the SA node and the AV node, and some of the sympathetic inputs, which are to the SA node and the AV node, control heart rate. The branch in the sympathetic side that goes to the ventricular wall 
can control other aspects of cardiac function. It's going to have uh, some things to do with uh, stroke volume. But this is showing you the connections here. Keep in mind that the, this part of the picture here is not at all anatomically correct. Okay. Um, we have the preganglionic parasympathetic fiber and the postganglionic parasympathetic fiber. This represents the postganglionic sympathetic fibers, which are branching into all these different places. Um, I hate this picture. Every book has it, and every book is wrong about it. Um, and the easy way to deal with it is to not stare at the, to not look too closely at the pictures. The basic concept of this picture is fine. It's the numbers that drive me crazy. So the top picture shows you action potential is fired by the SA node at it, normal, what I told you was 100 beats per minute. In fact, in that picture, it doesn't represent 100 beats per minute, but we'll ignore that fact. The point that we can see four peaks of action potentials there is fine. Okay. The second one, where we see only two peaks of an action potential, is showing that we're slowing that heart rate down. Okay. That's what the parasympathetic system does. The numbers are wrong. Okay. Parasympathetic system slows it down to 70 some odd beats per minute. I think that's supposed to be showing like uh, 40 beats per minute or something highly uh, irregular. But it's slower. Four at the top, two at the in the middle, and at the bottom we get to, what is that, five beats? Um, that's showing the sympathetic system speeding things up. So don't worry about the numbers in these graphs. The idea is the top one is SA node by itself, the middle one is the parasympathetic system slowing it down, and the bottom one is a sympathetic system speeding it up. That's really what these pictures are getting at. Um, every single book I've ever seen puts the numbers in this picture wrong. Um, because, I don't know, they always get this concept of uh, SA node, resting heart rate, and sympathetic thing kind of all jumbled up. But there you go. Um, I thought there was... All right, so I scrolled through a bunch of stuff. The main thing I want to talk about here is what influences stroke volume. And there are two main things that we control that influence stroke volume. And those are preload and contractility. Preload is actually a, a concept that applies to any muscle tissue. Here we're, of course, talking about it in terms of cardiac muscle tissue, um, but uh, there's something very similar to it that applies to skeletal muscle tissue. What preload really means is you can stretch muscle tissue out a little bit and increase the amount of contractile force that it can generate. And it's based simply on the um, sarcomere model of sliding filaments. Okay? So here, let's pretend my fingers are thick and thin filaments that are overlapped. When we have contraction, the thick filaments pull the thin filaments across and shorten the sarcomere. That's contraction. They can only go so far because the thin filaments from either side of the sarcomere get to the center and that's fully contracted. If you want more contraction, you can stretch the muscle out and then contract. That's what preload is. By stretching the muscle out, you increase the distance that the thin filaments can slide across the thick filaments. You can only do that up to a certain point. Okay, if you stretch too far and the thick filaments and the thin filaments are no longer overlapping, you won't get any contraction. But uh, there is always going to be a little bit of very, I mean, a little bit of give in the system, and you can stretch it out a little bit and get more contraction out of the sarcomere. And that's what preload is. Now, for um, a uh, skeletal muscle, it's very easy to demonstrate here. I can throw this thing without stretching uh, my biceps out at all. I get that much uh, force out of it. But if I want to stretch the muscle fibers out before I contract, preload the muscles, stretch it out like this, I can get a lot more active, uh, contraction out of it. That's preload. Right? Do the same thing in the heart, but in the heart, obviously you can't stretch your heart out before you beat like that. Um, Instead, what it is, is when you, uh, with each heartbeat, if you pump more blood into the heart, it's going to stretch the wall out, just like you fill a uh, 
uh, water balloon up. In your uh, veins, you keep a little extra blood on hand. Okay? Um, I think it's like two-thirds of the blood in your system is actually in the veins. Okay? It doesn't sit there unused, but you just sort of keep a reserve in your veins. And so when you need to uh, increase stroke volume, you can have your veins constrict, and it'll push that blood on in circulation when you get to the heart, stretch the heart out, that'll cause prelim. For the heart, that idea is referred to as the Frank Starling mechanism. Okay. Um, the same thing I just showed with you know throwing the uh, doorstop, but uh, for the heart, it's called the Frank Starling mechanism. Um, <clears throat> so by increasing the amount of blood getting into the heart, we stretch the wall of the heart out a little bit, and it's going to make it contract better. Okay. In doing that, we increase end diastolic volume. We put more blood into the heart, and when it contracts, it pushes more out, and we get to the roughly the same end systolic volume. So the difference between end diastolic and end systolic volume will be greater, stroke volume goes up. The other thing that we have control over is contractility. It might sound very similar to what I was just saying. We stretch the heart out, we can contract more. But contractility is really talking about the calcium input to the system. Remember, calcium binds to troponin. Troponin and tropomyosin move out of the way. Myosin can bind to actin, we have contraction. We study that in the skeletal muscle. Same thing applies to cardiac muscle. If you have more calcium in the system, then you're going to get more contraction more contractility. Um, if you have your average end diastolic volume, you're not stretching the muscle out at all, but you add calcium to the system, the heart's going to contract more forcefully and eject more blood. And that's going to lower end systolic volume, and you'll get a greater difference again, more stroke volume out of that. Now, we're usually going to have both happen a little bit together. But whatever it is, we're going to increase stroke volume through these two things. There is a third thing that applies, which is called afterload. But we don't really have a way of controlling afterload. Afterload is the pressure of blood in the aorta. Okay. The higher your blood pressure, the harder it is for your blood to push the aortic valve open and even start to eject blood. We do have mechanisms to regulate blood pressure, but they're acute mechanisms. If you have high blood pressure chronically, afterload is going to decrease your heart's ability to pump. It's going to limit your cardiac output. And your heart will just, and your whole system will just say, okay, we're happy with high blood pressure, we'll stick with it, and you just won't be as efficient. We don't have any mechanisms to deal with afterload in long-term situations. If something happens and afterload goes up briefly, we can lower blood pressure. But uh, generally speaking, this isn't really something that we can control. Preload and contractility are things that we can control. Now, preload and afterload sound like they're two sides of the same coin. They are not. They're not at all related. Preload is stretching muscle out. Afterload is aortic blood pressure. Okay. They're not related at all. But those are the main things that, that play into this. Um, this flow chart here is really showing you how all of these different factors come together to give us cardiac output. Okay. Uh, over on this side, we have what affects heart rate, which is really the autonomic system and a few hormones. And over here, we have all the things that affect stroke volume. We've got preload, contractility, and afterload here. Uh, and they have various effects on end diastolic volume or end systolic volume here. Okay, and we can follow it back to all the different things that contribute to those. So that kind of lays out all the different parts of regulating cardiac output. Okay. Um, over the years, I've gotten to the point where I kind of uh, move through this stuff kind of quickly and point out the big things. This is how I've been doing it for you know, probably about three or four semesters now. Um, it's not just because we're in the summer that I'm going quickly, but uh, I did. Um, 
This physiology, the cardiac output stuff, isn't so much important for next week's test. It's really more about the uh, part one, two, three, and four assignments for this uh, this chapter. Um, so uh, um, don't freak out if this went by fast. It's not going to be a big part of the test next week, but it's going to be regular stuff for this chapter's assignments, which you got to do it also too. But um, <clears throat> That's my quick rundown of how this stuff works to kind of direct you at uh, what you need to look at for this stuff. I skipped over a lot of things that are uh, not the major points of what's going on here, but this is essentially cardiac physiology. Questions? Yes? I was asking for questions about this. We'll deal with that stuff later on. Questions about cardiac physiology. Okay. So in this chapter, um, that was the cardiac physiology part, it goes on to development of the heart, which I don't really want to get into because I don't usually cover developmental issues. Um, but there is, uh, the embryonic heart is different from the adult heart. So if you're interested in that stuff, you can look at that um, simply because uh, in utero, the fetus is not getting um, uh, oxygen directly from its respiratory system. It's getting it through the mother's circulation, so the heart works differently there. If you're interested in that, you can look at it. I'm not going to go into it, which also means I'm not going to ask questions about it. Um, <clears throat> So I want to move into the blood vessel stuff, and I'm going to move through some of this stuff quickly because I just want you to see what it's uh, talking about here. Um, and I'll leave it to you to get a lot of this information. Now, the two cases for next week's class that are about the cardiovascular system, one of them is about congestive heart failure, and the other one's about a bloodborne disease, neither of which is concentrating on blood vessels which I do on purpose because it's kind of the last thing we do before the test. Um, that's not to say that you need to ignore blood vessels. Uh, they are important for how the heart pumps the blood through the system. So you need to be aware of blood vessels. But uh, I've made them kind of a minor part of the test just because it's the very last thing we do. Uh, this shows you kind of a schematic overview of circulation. We have the heart here with the pulmonary circuit, obviously going to the lungs and the systemic circuit going out to the body. And in the systemic circuit, they have um, the upper body and lower body are presented here. And then in the middle, they have some important things that have to do with organs that deal with um, blood in special ways. First off here, they have the renal circulation, uh, which isn't that uh, big of a deal because it just, in out circulation like we'd see for the rest of the body but it's separated out here because the kidneys are cleaning the blood they're removing waste products from the blood so it's kind of its own thing there um, and then it does look a little different here because we have blood vessels of the digestive tract stomach and intestines primarily um, that get arterial per, uh, blood in and then their venous blood coming out doesn't go just into general circulation. It goes instead to the kidney, to the liver. Okay. The liver has its own arterial input where it gets fresh blood, but it has this special input from the digestive tract where it gets the used blood from the digestive tract because the liver processes and helps clean out or detoxify the blood. Um, most toxins that we're going to take into our system, we're going to get through what we've ingested. So we absorb those toxins in the lining of the stomach and the intestines into the blood. So that blood goes to the heart, to the liver first. Okay. Um, the connection from the capillaries in the digestive tract to the capillaries in the liver go through a special kind of venous contract, uh, venous connection called a portal vein, okay? Um, <clears throat> there are two places where portal connections are uh, 
addressed in this class. I didn't talk about the first one, although you had a question about it in the uh, endocrine system chapter, but here's another place where we see it. A portal vein is just any vein going from one capillary bed to another, which is an unusual situation. And we see it for uh, a special thing in endocrine circulation, and then this special thing here for digestive circulation to pass through the liver before it returns for general circulation to help detoxify the blood. Um, <clears throat> here we have the general structure of an artery wall and the general structure of a uh, uh, vein wall. You can get most of the information from this straight anatomy. You can read it. Um, they have three layers. The layers are the same for both. They're called tunics, like the name for a type of coat. Uh, so three tunics are the layers. There's a, an external layer, the tunic externa, a middle layer called the tunica media, and then an internal layer called the tunica intima. I really wish it was called the tunica interna, just interna externa makes sense, but it's intima because it's intimate with the blood. It's the layer that's next to the blood. Okay. The tunica intima is the epithelial wall of the blood vessel, the tunica media is the muscular wall of the blood vessel, and the tunica externa is how the blood vessel is connected to surrounding tissue, okay. basically. There's a bit more to it. Uh, there's elastic tissue in arteries that's not found in veins. Um, larger blood vessels have their own blood supply, so in the tunica externa of large veins or large arteries, there are small blood vessels that provide blood supply to the outer tissues of those vessels. This micrograph shows an interesting property of arteries and veins. We're usually going to see them next to each other. Artery going into a vessel, I mean into an organ and the vein coming out. So this might be the splenic artery and the splenic vein, bringing blood, blood into and out of the spleen. Um, when we prepare material for the microscope slide, you're going to see this. The artery is going to retain its round structure and the vein is going to collapse. Arteries are kept open because of the elastic tissue in their walls. Veins don't have elastic tissue, so without blood in them, they collapse. Um, <clears throat> if you could mentally reinflate this vein, you should notice that the vein is larger than the artery. Okay. And that's pretty standard. Uh, for blood flow into and out of organs, you need to keep blood flow equal. Pressure is higher in arteries because they're closer to the heart, where the blood, the pressure's being generated by systole. Um, pressure's lower in the vein because it's downstream, but to offset the pressure differential, the diameter plays a part. Um, <clears throat> the inner diameter of an artery is small, the inner diameter of a vein is large, which allows for differences in blood flow. Um, what's affecting blood flow is a property we call resistance. Um, if I'm going to walk across the front of the room here, I can walk fairly easily because I lift my foot with each footstep. But if I don't lift my feet and I just drag them along, it's a lot harder for me to walk. That's resistance. The friction of my feet against the floor makes it harder for me to walk. The friction of blood against the wall of the blood vessel makes it harder to flow. The bigger the blood vessel is, the less friction. Think of it like uh, rivers. A big river like the Connecticut, water flows fast because there's a lot of water to a little bit of a uh, river bank. But a small river, uh, Mill River, where, I'm, where I live up the, the ways there, moves pretty slow because there's a lot less water can, compared to the amount of river bank there. So there's a lot of more friction of the water against the, the blood uh, river bank. Same thing here. There's more friction of blood moving through this narrow artery compared to the friction of blood moving through the huge vein. Okay, so the trade-off between pressure, high pressure in the artery, low pressure in the vein, and resistance 
high resistance in the artery, low resistance in the vein, is going to keep blood flow equal. Okay, you have to have the same amount of blood going into something as coming out of something. If you have more blood going in than coming out, then that something is going to fill up with blood and burst. If you have more blood coming out than going in, then you're going to drain blood out of that. So blood flow has to be equal in and out of organs. And <clears throat> the offset between pressure and resistance helps with that. Um, <clears throat> arteries and veins are the two basic vessels here, but really there's more vessels. Uh, oh, here's where it talks about the layers. Um, there are three different types of vessels that fall into the arterial group, the artery side of circulation. Um, the first two are in fact called arteries. There's the elastic artery, so named because it has a lot of elastic tissue in it, and the muscular artery, which has less elastic tissue and the muscular component is more important. Um, these are different types of blood vessels because the tissues that make them up are very different. And then we have the arteriole, which is a microscopic artery. And the way that this is drawn, you can see the muscle layer here, we can see the individual cells very well, whereas in the uh, full arteries, the cells are very small, so we can't, can't see them too well there. So this is just a matter of scale between these. So there's three types of arteries, three vessels on the arterial side. And then um, we have capillaries. Um, <clears throat> Capillaries vary in how much they allow to filter in and out of the blood supply. Uh, we have very tight, uh, not tight, very restrictive capillaries called continuous capillaries, somewhat leaky capillaries called fenestrated capillaries, and very leaky capillaries called sinusoidal capillaries. Um, in any given capillary bed, there should only be one of these types of capillaries. Um, and depending on where we're looking, we're going to have a different type. So uh, where you have a restrictive blood supply, you're going to have continuous capillaries, like in the brain. Um, where you have practically non-existent uh, um, restriction of the blood supply, you're going to have sinusoidal capillaries, which you see in the liver and the spleen. And then everywhere else, it's kind of in the middle, which is going to be fenestrated. Um, now, the liver and the, the spleen filter blood. That's their main uh, job. So their capillaries uh, allow for a lot of things to go through, including blood cells. Get rid of old red blood cells in the liver, the spleen. Uh, I guess I should say, uh, I won't say that because I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, they clear red blood cells out and that sort of thing. So they're very leaky. Fenestrated capillaries will allow a little bit of leakage, but not things like cells. So the, the kidneys have fenestrated capillaries because you don't want blood cells getting out in the kidneys. Kidneys are just filtering out uh, waste molecules and that sort of thing. And then your average capillary bed where you're getting just normal exchange of things uh, with tissues, that's going to be a fenestrated capillary also. Fenestrated means filled with holes. Actually, fenestrated means filled with windows. Fenster means win, or uh, in German, fenster means window, uh, which for some strange reason is the Latin word for window. Um, <clears throat> usually you don't have Latin German cognates like that. Um, the only use of fenestrated that I'm familiar with outside of talking about fenestrated capillaries is the term defenestrated which means to throw something out a window. Um, and the only time I've actually come across the word defenestrated is in talking about cats. Okay. <laughs> now, I said throwing things out the window uh, on purpose because that's not what defenestration of cats is about. Cats jump out of windows. Cat cats defenestrate themselves. Um, you know, cats can't be contained. You have a, a window, it's going to get out. Um, but uh, such a formal word for cats leaving through windows is used because there's actually been research into defenestration of cats. Um, and it was done in New York City where defenestration of cats is a big deal because not all windows are close to the ground level. Um, by looking at uh, results from uh, veterinarians, 
of the survival of cats after defenestration, they came up with an interesting finding. Up to about seven floors, defenestrated cats survive pretty well. After 15 floors on up, they survive pretty well too. It's somewhere in the 17 to seven to 15 floor range. Defenestrated cats don't survive the fall. <laughs> it has to do with, you know, the, the sort of old wives' tale that cats always land on their feet kind of thing. So that's, they're pretty good at landing from high jumps like that. Between 7 and 15 floors, for some reason, because of air velocity and drag and something like that, they can't really rate themselves too well. But once it's above 15 floors, terminal velocity, which just means a Air drag is equal to acceleration, not that they're going to die. Um, that gives them the ability to write uh, their body position and actually land on their feet. So they're more likely to survive falling out of a 15 floor, floor uh, window than out of a 10 floor window. So that's the only place where fenestrators ever come out outside of talking about capillaries. But it's just an interesting thing. And I always like uh, seeing people react to the throwing cats out of window implication. But it's the cats that do do it themselves. They jump out of windows. They see birds or whatever. I don't know. They, they leave. So. Uh, anyways, those are fenestrated capillaries. Um, they have holes, pores, windows, whatever you want to say, so that more stuff can filter through. But they're not as leaky as sinusoidal capillaries. Um, here we see just a representation, not a very accurate anatomical representation of a capillary bed. Capillary beds are much more extensive than this picture suggests, but um, from the red arterial side to the blue venous side, blood can flow through the capillaries. There are sphincter muscles at the opening of capillaries from the arterial side, and if they're closed off, which this picture suggests, blood will not enter in the capillaries and will just go straight through from one side to the other. Okay. Um, it's also po possible for blood to completely bypass capillaries completely through direct arterial venous connections called anastomosis, which is pointed out here. Uh, then we get into the vein side of things. Um, there are just venules and veins, but this picture shows three things. This is the wall of a venule, uh, sorry, this is a wall of a venule, and these are two veins. Books always do this to try to map. We had the three types of arter arterial things, the elastic artery, the muscular artery, and the arterial. So when they do this, they make three pictures. But in fact, two of them are just veins. And then the third one's a venule. In this book, they make the suggestion that medium-sized veins have valves and large-sized veins don't. I'm not positive if that's true or not, but I've never heard that anywhere else. Um, just, you have veins. They are varying sizes, but they're all veins. Um, arteries, you have elastic and muscular arteries. Elastic arteries are big, like the aorta, and muscular arteries are smaller, but they're functionally different, too, because of how they work. Okay. So, uh, you have three types of arteries, uh, capillaries between those and veins, and you have veins and venules, just two types of things, even though this picture shows three. I point that out because in some pictures I want to show you a little bit later on, they're going to have a scale showing systemic circulation. It'll go from the aorta to the vena cava, and it'll have elastic artery, elastic, I mean, sorry, elastic artery, muscular artery, arterial, capillary, venule, vein, to vena cava. So there's just those six things in between. Artery, uh, sorry. Elastic artery, muscular artery, arterial, capillary, venule, vein. That's systemic circulation. And I'll point that out in a second. Um, now an important part for understanding what's happening in blood vessels is about blood flow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Huh. Um, I thought it started off with defining what blood flow is, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, this is a picture just depicting blood pressure in the circulation. And here's actually where we start to see that, uh, what I was just saying in the um, 
figure here. So we have elastic artery, muscular artery, arterial, capillary, venule, veins, uh, etc. The aorta is an elastic capillary. The, ven the vena cava is a vein. Why they have them separate out, I'm not quite sure, but um, that's the uh, circulation. In the arterial side of circulation, blood pressure varies based on systole and, and diastole of the heart. Okay? So we see the line going up and down, up and down, until we get to the end of arterioles, and it sort of stabilizes through capillary. Too much in capillaries. Uh, and then it's, since it's stabilized, it's going to stay continuous through venules and veins all the way through. The pressure is going to decrease the further we get from the heart. The heart's what's creating the pressure, and it's creating enough pressure to push blood all the way through systemic circulation. The line that we see going through the arterial side, that's the average or mean arterial pressure. Um, it's not a pure average. What would a pure average of 120 over 80 be? It's the average of those two numbers. Halfway between 120 and 80. Mean arterial pressure is actually a little bit lower than that. The book explains how it's calculated. I'm not going to ask you to calculate it, but the take home message is because the heart's relaxed more than it's contracting, there's more diastole than systole, uh, the pressure's a, on average a little bit below 100, which is what that line is suggesting. Um, <clears throat> pulse pressure is just what we call the difference between systolic and uh, diastolic pressure. So if you're feeling somebody's pres pressure, feeling somebody's pulse, you're feeling that change in pressure. So each time you feel the systolic pressure hitting its peak and then going down, at the bottom of that is the diastolic pressure. So that's the pulse pressure that you're feeling. Uh, and that definition kind of goes into the calculation for mean arterial pressure, which again, I'm not going to ask you to calculate, but if you'd like to understand what it's saying, it's explained there. Okay. Um, a little bit more about measuring pulse. Uh, this is about how blood pressure is measured. Um, you cut circulation off with uh, inflating a cuff, and then you bleed that pressure off from the cuff until it drops below systolic pressure, and each heartbeat will push against that pressure a little bit, and you can hear that pushing until it drops below diastolic pressure, so you can hear the sounds made during uh, heart, I mean, with each heartbeat, while pressure in the cuff is between systolic and diastolic pressure. Um, ah, here's where I want to get to. Uh, I thought I'd start off with this stuff, but uh, this is talking about what is defining blood flow. And if you look at this, it should scare the hell out of you. <laughs> a lot of mathematical symbols and that sort of thing. Um, just a very complete description of what's going on. But um, a lot of these things are constants, or not constants, but fixed values for the most part. Um, pi is a constant that has to do with the uh, calculating area and circumference, I mean, area and, yeah, circumference of circles, which would be cross section of blood vessel, that kind of thing. Um, the uh, Thing looks like an upside down, upside down Y. That's a lambda, which is represents the length of a blood vessel. Um, this kind of weird N thing here uh, is how thick the blood is, um, and R there's radius. Uh, what's most important is pressure, represented by the P, and then the triangle before that is the Greek letter delta, which represents a change. Blood flow is driven by pressure differentials, okay? the change in pressure, which we already saw. Blood in the heart moves from high pressure to low pressure. So the greater the difference in pressure, the greater the blood flow. And okay? that's what that relationship is showing. Okay? Some of these other uh, components in here, the pi and r and eight, eta, lambda stuff, uh, all contributes to understanding resistance. 
Now, I talked about resistance a second ago with me dragging my feet across the floor here. But more accurately, resistance and blood flow is about, uh, well, viscosity, which would be kind of like dragging my feet, uh, how thick the blood is. But also diameter. Okay? So a more accurate way of depicting ref, uh, resistance for me walking would be if I could lower the ceiling of this room down to half its height. So it's at eight feet now, and it's easy for me to walk around because my head is nowhere near the ceiling. But if the ceiling came down to four feet, then I'd have to bend over, and I would not be able to walk as fast across the room. Okay. So <clears throat> it's not getting at the friction idea of, of resistance, but just the height of the, the ceiling restricts my ability to move quickly. This diameter of a blood vessel is also going to influence how well blood can move through it. Okay, that's resistance kind of stuff. So all of this stuff can kind of boil down to blood flow is equal to the ratio between pressure and resistance. Okay. Um, and they just rearrange things a little bit here because you can do that in math and it's fun, I guess. But uh, that's the take-home message. Okay. Um, we can alter blood flow by changing pressure. If we want more pressure in the system, heart beats faster uh, or uh, contractility or something like that goes up, we have more pressure behind uh, the system, which is basically cardiac output. Uh, resistance is largely under control of blood vessel diameter, which is the muscles in the blood vessels. We can constrict and they can relax, that kind of thing. That'll affect blood flow, that kind of thing. Um, so it's defining a lot of those different things. This figure kind of puts all of those ideas together. Not very well, but puts them all together. Um, vessel diameter contributes, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, this is vessel diameter represented for all of the different uh, components of sy systemic circulation. Elastic arteries, starting with the aorta, are going to be about two and a half centimeters in diameter. And diameter is going to go down progressively as we see arteries branch and branch and branch until we get to capillaries, which on average are going to be about eight micrometers in diameter because it's how big uh, red blood cells are. And then as we move out of capillaries, the venules and the veins are going to get wider and wider until we get all the way to the vena cava, which is the widest of the veins. Okay. That's just showing you that. Um, <clears throat> Diameter is going to be important for resistance in any single given blood vessel. But blood has to go through all of those vessels. Okay? There's no way that blood can get a, from the elastic arteries to the vena cava directly. It has to go through the other arteries, the arterioles, capillaries, venules, and smaller veins to get there. It has to go through that. So even though uh, circumference drops off, the resistance is offset because another way we can think about things is in uh, the cross-sectional area of the vessels. Okay. If we take the cross-sectional area of, say, the aorta, okay, it's two and a half centimeters in diameter, its cross-sectional area is going to be uh, pi r squared, okay. pi times 1.25 squared. That'll give us the area of that one vessel. There's only one aorta. Okay. And then it branches to give rise to smaller arteries. Each of those will have their own cross-sectional area, but they're all branches off the aorta, so they're all getting some of that blood. And we can think about their cross-sectional area as a total area. So if we have um, eventually capillaries that are 0.25 centimeters in diameter, then each one's individual cross-sectional area will be pi times 0.125 uh, squared, uh, which is going to be a much smaller cross-sectional area than the aorta itself. But if we have 200 of those, their overall cross-sectional area is going to add up to more than the cross-sectional area of the um, capillary. <coughs> Sorry, uh, of the aorta. And we have so many capillaries that even though each one has a very, very small cross-sectional area, adding the cross-sectional area for all of the capillaries in your body up all over, uh, 
they equal a huge cross-sectional area relative to something like the aorta. So <clears throat> I've never thought up a very good way of depicting this, but imagine this. Uh, you have a thousand people, 10,000 people, let's say, trying to get into a stadium for a concert. And the stadium has one big door. You open that big door up and 10,000 people try to get through it. What's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to be hard for all of them to get through there very easily. But let's imagine instead the stadium, instead of having one big door, had a bunch of person-sized doors all the way around the stadium. All of them open up at the same time. All 10,000 people can move into the stadium at once. Okay. Each door is smaller than the one big door, but it makes it easier for all the small components to move through. Okay. Not a great representation of this idea, but... <clears throat> All of the capillaries allow for little bits of blood to uh, separate out and move through the system individually, which is going to offset the major resistance in each individual capillary. Okay. So that's going to help sort of even out blood flow. Um, here's essentially the same car, uh, curve for blood pressure that I showed you before. Uh, it doesn't have the arterial stuff going up and down, and the mean arterial pressure really should be a little bit lower but we have that. Um, and then this is the overall velocity. So if you combine pressure and resistance uh, across the whole system, it's going to you know, have very quick blood flow out from the heart to the capillaries, and then a gradual return back to the heart, okay, blood flow overall. Um, I have my own cardiac issues, which I think I mentioned at the beginning of the semester. Um, I've had personal experience with the velocity of blood flow. It's really kind of cool. Um, I've had a couple of times done what's called a cardiac catheterization. So catheter was in, inserted through my femoral vein, went up into my um, right atrium, uh, and they released a uh, radio-opaque dye into the heart. Now the point of that is a radio-opaque dye you can see on an x-ray. Now you do that for a few different reasons. Um, most commonly it's done for an angiogram to see if there are any blockages of cardiac arteries uh, on the surface of the heart. For me it was done for a different reason because of my particular heart condition. But uh, what's really cool when that happens, the radio opaque dye is a little bit warmer than body temperature. So you can feel when they inject it into your heart, there's this little like warm fuzzy feeling in your heart for a second. And then one heartbeat later, that warm, fuzzy feeling gets all over your body. Okay. To have the cardiac catheterization done, they tape your head down to the, to the table where they're doing it. Because that instantaneous burst of that warm dye getting throughout your body is really surprising. And so you're taped down, you don't want to go, oh my gosh, and throw off the, uh, the x-ray they're about to take. But uh, it's a really cool experience. I don't recommend you go out and try to get a career. <laughs> but the fact that I've had to have a couple of them in my life um, gave me the opportunity to really have the, a very personal experience of how fast blood does move from the heart out to the rest of the body. In one heartbeat, I could feel that warm dye in my toes. Okay. Now, I was talking about cardiac output, that all of the blood five liters of blood moves through your heart over the course of a minute. Um, and what I'm describing here isn't saying that all of your blood's pumped out all at once, but components of your blood can be pumped in one heartbeat all the way out to your extremities. And it's really a pretty you know, interesting feeling, which is kind of depicted there. So um, <clears throat> what this shows is blood flow is very rapid out to the capillaries and it's very slow through the capillaries where we want exchange of nutrients and that sort of thing to take place. And then it picks up as we get back towards the heart. And part of what picks that up is uh, the very low resistance in veins. Um, it helps to get them back, as well as a couple of things that really help the blood flow back to the heart. Um, when I'm walking around up here, it's helping to get blood back to my heart because the veins going through the muscles in my leg as I'm walking, they're getting squeezed, and that's pushing the blood back up to my heart. Uh, breathing helps a little bit too. 
When you breathe, the pressure between your thoracic and abdominal cavities changes, and that changing in pressure with each breath helps to push blood up uh, the last little bit to the heart. Um, the book refers to those, the uh, skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump. Those are just passive exploits of things that your body's already doing to help get blood back, okay? uh, which helps to get the blood flow back up to the heart there. Even though the pressure is falling off almost to zero, uh, flow goes back up because of low resistance and the passive pumping uh, components. Here's a picture of the skeletal pump here. Uh, there's not a picture of the respiratory pump. There never is. There's always a picture of this one. I guess it's really hard to, to pick the respiratory pump, but it's really just when you're breathing. You breathe in, pressure increases in your abdominal cavity, which is going to push blood up. When you breathe out, <coughs> pressure drops in your abdominal cavity, more blood will move in. Push it up, relax. It just helps to pump the blood up. You don't have to be quite as dramatic about breathing, but the whole thing helps a little bit. Um, so that's blood flow. Um, <clears throat> it introduces the idea of capillary exchange. Um, and really all I want to say about this is pressure going into capillaries and pressure coming out of capillaries is different. If you look at those curves I was just showing you, going into capillaries, the pressure is, uh, according to this, about 35 millimeters of mercury coming out. It's about, I think this is 18. Um, it's that drop off in pressure that helps it, uh, exchange things from the blood to the tissue and the tissue back into the blood. On the arterial side, um, there's more blood pressure, so it's pushing things out of the blood. Uh, on the venous side, the blood pressure's dropped, so things can move back in. <clears throat> now, there's blood pressure on both sides. It's just that there's a competing pressure of osmosis pushing water back into the blood. And so osmotic pressure is not high enough to offset the blood pressure on the arterial side, but it is greater than the venous side, and so things move back into the veins. Um, they are, however, not equal. Okay? More stuff comes out of the blood than gets back into the blood. So we actually lose stuff out of our circulation and all of our tissues. And... Um, <clears throat> we have what are called lymphatic capillaries that help to reclaim that fluid and bring it back into our system. Now this is the last paragraph of this section here talking about um, capillaries <clears throat> because we want to pull the lymphatic system in to say it helps out with circulation. But the lymphatic system is the next chapter. Okay. So I'm going to start off with the lymphatic system to remind you of this point out this capillary exchange thing and how we lose stuff out of our blood and our tissues. And I'll pick up with explaining how the lymphatic capillaries help to bring that fluid back. And that's going to set up what the lymphatic system is about and how immunity takes advantage of uh, that system, uh, how it works to uh, help protect our bodies. So um, that's what I'll pick up with next time. Um, there's a section on uh, homeostatic regulation, um, which talks a little bit about um, uh, autonomic and endocrine roles that are played. Um, largely, the kidneys have the endocrine control over blood vessel, I mean, over blood pressure. Um, and so this is kind of getting at some of those aspects of it. Um, and then the cardiovascular centers that I mentioned earlier about in the um, medulla, the cardio accelerator and cardio inhibitory areas, um, they can also play a role in this. And within the cardio accelerator areas, there's a special vasomotor area that controls blood pressure directly, um, though pressure and uh, heart rate are kind of linked together to some degree. Um, and then some reflexes, and uh, here's the endocrine stuff. Renin comes from the kidneys, and it sets up a, f a mechanism that controls things, um, which is kind of highlighted here. 
a lot of the stuff we're going to pick up again when we talk about the kidneys, uh, renal system, where it's probably uh, more important. So it's there. Um, and then finally, uh, this is more relevant to next week. Uh, this is a circulatory pathway section, which is kind of the lab book part of the chapter, uh, which has pictures of where blood vessels are. Um, in preparing for next week, I would suggest you look at some of these pictures and especially find stuff that have to do with what's going on in the case. So one case is about the heart. So be sure you're familiar with the blood vessels that are attached to the heart, not just the four that we talked about last week, but also the coronary arteries, which I've mentioned a few times today that have to do with heart attacks. Um, and then this is just the entire systemic circulation, the red picture for arteries. There's a blue picture later on for veins. Um, so anything in the cases that have to do with specific locations of circulation, be sure you pay attention to that in this part of the chapter too. Well, hidden with the cases. Um, and uh, Amanda, you were asking about uh, vascular lab quiz, and there is not a vascular lab quiz um, because it's always the last material before the uh, practical, so um, I don't have a lab quiz about that, and we're not really doing any lab stuff about it today. Anyway, so. so just the heart and EKG lab quiz, um, which is partly about the anatomy from last week, uh, chambers, vessels, and valves, as well as the EKG stuff. Not so much the cardiac output, more the EKG stuff. Than the um, so if you would like to, for a little while, take a look at uh, hearts before you head out, there are models here you're welcome to, but I'm done. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.